So anything you bring to the marriage, if you'd have brought the bedroom set to the marriage, it would have been yours. If you got it willed to you during the marriage, it still is yours. Or the third one is anything that you buy with money that is willed to you is separate property. So if your grandmother would have left you $20,000, you use that 20,000 to go buy that bedroom set while you're married, still separate property because the money was yours and all you did was trade the money for another object. Cameron? So I have a scenario. Um, I got uh, an inheritance from my grandmother, but I really don't benefit from it until like I'm 30. So I um like received the will before I got married. So would like once that like the will does take account when I am 30, what's like is it still like you half and half or is will okay. I am not a practicing attorney. So do not construe this as legal advice, but based on what I know from this, you were awarded that money when you were single, even though you don't have access to it. When you get married, that is private property because you brought that will to the marriage. All right, let's say you get married and you, got, you decide to buy a car with that money. When you get divorced, notice I said when, not if. I'm sorry, that was bad. If you should get divorced, and I would not want that on anybody. If you would get divorced, that car is yours. It is not community property because you bought it from money that was willed to you, which was separate property because you had it before the marriage. And all you did was take your grandmother's 10 grand and trade it for an asset that your wife shouldn't get because it came from your family's suffering of a death and now you inherited it. Okay. Okay. I know for a fact there have been several lawsuits over this because here's what could happen. Let's say you got willed a million dollars and then you get married and buy a house with that money. Your wife potentially at the divorce could try and claim tenants by the entirety because you got it while you were married, but you're going to claim, no, I used money that was willed to me prior to the marriage, so it's not community property. Hasta la vista. I have seen court cases where that has happened. Where they, one claim, hey, I have an interest in the property because we were married when we bought it. And the other is like, yeah, but I bought it from funds that were mine prior to the marriage. So it could get very sneaky. All right. Community property states, and there are like nine of them, and I think they're listed in the book, California is the one you hear about the most. Community property states, once you say I do, half of it's your spouse's. I don't care when you got it, who you got it from, where it came from, what you did to get it, none of that. If you owned a car outright, got married in a community property state, got divorced the next day, that spouse is entitled to half the value of that car, even though you owned it outright free and clear before you married. California, Wisconsin, Nevada, Louisiana, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, Arizona. All right, so never one, get married in those states. 
Alaska is funny. Alaska, the marrying couple can declare if it's community property or separate before they get married. Talk about an argument. Well, honey, since I'm rich, I want this to be a separate property state. All right. So while you're married, it's all community. It's prior to marriage, if it's a community or separate property state that really affects what we're talking about. There's one other interesting thing and an anomaly that I came across while studying for this. If you are in an accident and get hurt, and the court awards you like suffering, pain and suffering. You've heard of that, right? Hey, Shauna hit me with the car, I got a broken hip. Now I'm gonna have pain and suffering the rest of my life. Her insurance company pays me a million dollars for my pain and suffering. That is considered separate property, even if you get divorced. Since I'm the one actually suffering real pain from this, your spouse doesn't benefit. Now, if we stay married and I buy stuff, then cool. But if I use that money or we get divorced, pain and suffering award, judgment awards are actually private property. I thought that was just interesting. I put a note in my book. I don't think we'd ever be involved in that. All right, so any questions about concurrent owners? The biggest thing to remember, joint tenants, tenants in common, is the actual disposition. J joint tenants can't get rid of the property, it gets absorbed by the others, where tenants in common, you can get rid of the property, sell it, trade it, lease it, give it away, do whatever you want, all right? There is a third way to own property, but before we get there, I wanna talk about one other thing as a side note, from here on out in the rest of the book, you will see these terms used. There are terms that end in the word EE -E and terms that end in the word OR. Vendi, vendor, grantee, grantor, less E, less or, mortgagee, mortgagor, all right? So the mortgage, the EE, -E, the way that I always remember is it. this is the person it's done to. The less E is the one that receives the lead, the lease. The grantee is the one that receives the grant of the property, the mortgage E. The OR is the one who is actually doing the action. The lessor is the one doing the lease. We call him a landlord. The grantor is the one granting the property. We call him a seller. The mortgage or is the one giving the mortgage. The vendor is the one giving the land contract. So keep that in mind. We're going to see that pop up right now in this third version that we have these words that end in EE -E and the words that end in OR. So the third way to own property is this legal person called a trust. A trust is a device by which a person can own property or transfer property into a living artificial entity so as to not be the actual owner of the property. It will name a beneficiary who benefits from the trust. So what you see is this. This person deeds property into this legal document called a trust. So the person who wrote the trust is called the trustor, right? That's the OR, they're the ones doing it. They put the property into this legal document called a trust. Because that trust can't really walk and talk and speak, the trust will name a person to act in its behalf 
and this is the word you have seen before, called a trustee. There's the OR. In that trust, they will name a person who can benefit from whatever's in the trust. They are called a beneficiary. That beneficiary is the person who receives the benefit of whatever is in that trust. And you can put anything in that trust. You can put personal property, you can put money, you can put real estate, and in that case, it is called a land trust. This is the one we're talking about today. Used to be called an Illinois land trust because Illinois was the first one that really accepted this. Now they just call them land trust. You can put money in a trust. You ever heard of the term trust fund, baby? This is exactly what I'm talking about. Rich man puts a bunch of money into a trust. That trust is run by a money manager who would be the trustee. And then they would name somebody who would get the benefit or the interest earned on that trust. A great example would be like Paris Hilton. Her grandfather, Conrad Hilton, put a bunch of money into a trust. And the trust says on the anniversary of her birth, i.e. her birthday, the trust is supposed to dole out some money to her. And the trustee literally would write a check and to Paris Hilton and say, okay, it's your birthday. The trust is awarding you some money. A lot of investors use this concept. They will be the trustor. They will deed the property into a trust and then name themselves as the beneficiary. So when the trust collects the monthly rent from the tenant, it would pay that beneficiary the rent money. This is how I have done a lot of properties. I put a, a rental property into a trust. I have named a trustee and I'm not telling you his name. I trust two people in the world, me, and you're not the other one. When my trustee collects the rent, he then writes a check to the beneficiary, which I named as me. So I get a, I collect the benefits of the trust. How do you go about setting that up? Like, what's the process? I am not a practicing attorney. You actually have to have an attorney, all right? Attorney will write this trust for you, and it can be kind of expensive depending on what you're doing. I've seen them anywhere from four or 500 to tens and twenties of thousands of dollars, all right? Because that trust, has to have about every conceivable concept that would ever happen. So should that happen, the trustee, think of the trust the best way that I always, when I first learned it, it's like an instruction booklet. Now, Cameron, and we can see your book right in front of your camera. So I would call the trustee, you, and go, hey man, uh, taxes are due on that piece of real estate. You need to take care of it. So you would look in your book under, taxes and it would literally say on the day taxes are due you as the trustee should write a check to the indiana department of revenue for the amount of outstanding taxes so go ahead and do that because you're the trustee so think of that trust as a instruction booklet that would guide the trustee on his actions cameron you don't make the decision you follow the instruction booklet all right. So that instruction booklet has to be pretty thorough. And you and I, as lay people, probably have not thought of everything that could ever happen. But attorneys, 
since that's their job, they have probably written thousands of them. And they're like, oh yeah, there's one example, we need to do this. What happens if it floods? Let's put that in there. What happens if there's an earthquake? What happens if there's an insurance check? Who do you contact if they're sued? So you would have an attorney set that up for you and you wanna make sure it's pretty airtight so that nobody can get around that. 